Thank you so much. And thanks. I'd like to thank you again for inviting us. I am especially honored to be in, in partnership with the presenters today. First is Amanda Lattimore, the director for the Center of, for Addiction Research and Effective Solutions, the American Institutes for Research. Echo Yanka, professor of law at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, Yeshiva University. And my friend Monique Tula, the executive director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us. Um, I'd like to set a framing question, and I believe from there we'll probably go on and, and have a, a very rich discussion. But we all know that this is a time that has been um, particularly fraught. People are starting to talk about uh, health inequities, racial disparities, racial justice. And I was just like, I think it would be a great idea if we could have each of you talk for two or three minutes about what your blue sky vision is from your particular perch. Maybe your one year blue sky vision and then your five year blue sky vision. How will we provide care, service, look at data, use the justice system or not for people who use drugs? What would that equitable world look like? One that is equitable across race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, ability, and all other intersections. Would it mean disaggregated data that's not that's used for good, not ill? Is it not working to punish, actually equitably working to keep people out of punitive systems? So I wonder if each of you could give kind of a two to three minute blue sky and a vision of what that looks like in the short term and the long term. Let's start with Monique. Thanks, Kima. So it's a big question. Um, I loved pondering it uh, over the last couple of days and you know, I envision a world where a just society includes the regulation of drugs um, that's grounded in science, but also human rights and the treatment of people who use drugs are also grounded in compassion and well being. You know, we're really at a turning point societally. Many people around the world, including me, believe that we're evolving as a species. And evolution isn't linear. We're evolving in our consciousness, but it happens in cycles. So we regress, we advance, we regress again. Um, and the challenges that we're experiencing force us to go deeper. And that, that journey really begins the, begets the transcendence that we're looking for, the transformation that we're looking for. So we are seeing across the, the globe, newly activated social justice warriors who are hungry for a shared and cohesive sense of direction. And so if we're gonna survive this particular period of regression, we need the strength and clarity of consciousness to break free from um, the defensive posture that we've held for decades, if not centuries. So as we're awakening, we're being to value the primacy of unconditional love and forgiveness, because if we're all interconnected, then harm to one person is harm to ourselves. So for me, the future is racially just. The future is equitable for all. The future centers people with lived experience in the way we describe them, in the language that we use. The future is one where people are fairly compensated for their work and one where housing is accessible, affordable, and safe. Essentially, the future is powered by people who historically have been pushed to society's bulging margins. We don't often get a cha chance to, to change or we don't change really until we're in a state of crisis and we're definitely there now and, you know, it could get work, but we need this crisis to grow. Society needs to break down so that something new can evolve. Thank you. Definitely want to live in your world. Amanda, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, and what a great question. Um, I think that the future that I'd like to see uh, involves the integration of um, approaching addiction in this country through the social determinants of health. And that means uh, that we consider um, the root causes of addiction, the root causes of overdoses. Um, that means taking into consideration employment and how that influences overdoses. You know, it's very relevant for now when we're facing um, economic downturns. How is this going to influence overdose rates moving forward? Um, it, uh, social determinants of health lens means uh, considering housing, providing housing uh, to those who are re-entering society. 
Um, it means taking a closer look at the criminal justice system and all of the resources we are pouring into the criminal justice system um, when we could potentially be pouring that um, those resources into supporting those who are intersecting with law enforcement and could use services instead of jail time. Um, it means thinking about food and access to food, access to basic necessities, um, and how the lack of access to those things in the social uh, networks, supportive social networks, education, how those um, lead to uh, downstream consequences related to addiction. Great, thank you. And last but certainly not least, Echo. Uh, first, thank you for having me. Um, we Those two great answers already ahead of me. Maybe the best I can do is to tie them together a little bit. Um, I think in some sense, the future, uh, a, a bright future for dealing with the opioid epidemic is, is neither um, simple nor easy, but it's also not mysterious. It is, I sometimes say quippishly, it is a future in which we treat people as though we actually value. And that sounds very cynical and mean. But let me say a little bit of what I mean. Think of a town that is uh, your happy version of a town. It could be a big city, a college town, whatever it is that is your happy place. Um, and think of how you would want that town treated if it were going through some amount of drug problems. So for example, think about college kids, people that we value, we see a future for, we invest in. It might be the case that widespread drug use will have some role for police. There'll be some disorder, there'll be some problems, there'll be a few people driven to steal or even hurt. And we'll want to address those people. But that's not the way we would address the root, as was being said of the, of the addiction problem, right? When we see drug problems in communities we care about, in, in towns we care about, we care about where it's coming from, how to find alternatives, housing and uh, employment opportunities were just addressed root social trauma were addressed. And most importantly, we care about doing the kinds of things that mean that they'll want to turn away from drug use, not policing the drug use out of existence, right? So in a real sense, you know, the future is to imagine the kind of past that we have treasured and frankly, sometimes imagined or fabricated and to stick to those principles where everybody actually is somebody we value. Excellent. I'd like to kind of, and so now I'm going to um, throw COVID in here. I know I, it seems with COVID and with George Floyd, all people are recognizing that there's disparities, that there's racial injustices. And I, I'm going to tie something Echo said with Mo, what Monique said in the sense of this isn't just about substance use. There are disparities because of substance use. There are disparities because historically we don't value people. We treat people differently. There isn't love that's necessary. And I think sometimes, I think, um, I statement, I think sometimes the focus on drugs and whether the criminal justice system is involved or not, and I've showed my hand, I don't believe it should be, um, is a, Sometimes we focus on solving one problem when really it's a societal problem. So say we do think about substance use in a broader, more human way. That still doesn't get us away from those COVID disparities that influence substances and how people are used, who dies, who doesn't. And so if you take that vision out a little bigger and get back to those social determinants of health and get back to how to have healthy folk, healthy people, um, equality in all spheres, whether someone uses drugs or not, and you have the opportunity to talk to President Biden, what is the first step you would ask him to take? Because I challenge us, and part of the thing is, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat frustrated at this time that we often are like, well, we solve this widget, we'll get to here, we solve that widget. I feel like, you know, as Monique said, we've regressed and we've seen this is not a widget. This is a big problem that we've ignored and chosen not to address. And so to get out of that, do you have ideas on what that first step could be knowing we're in, as someone said today, an ultra marathon perhaps, not even a marathon? 
So I think that, you know, the, the transition of the Biden-Harris administration is, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity for us to get our priorities right. Big picture, let's end the war on drugs and the policing of black and brown communities. So do I think that, you know, Biden-Harris are actually going to burn it down and abolish policing? No, but reforming and abolishing the criminal justice system really needs to be the priority of every drug policy, public health, and education advocate. And, you know, we know that the criminalization of drug use and drug users is behind the explosion of uh, U.S. jails and prisons. And this kind of aggressive, aggressive policing to solve public health and social conditions like addi addiction is causing egregious, long-lasting, traumatic uh, um, you know, harm to people who use drugs in their families. You know, at the federal level, people who are incarcerated on a drug conviction make up nearly half of the prison population. And most aren't high actors in the drug trade, you know, uh, most have no prior criminal record for a violent offense. So, you know, carrying a conviction, a conviction, conviction, sorry, carrying a conviction is long lasting. Right. If you were ever convicted or arrested for drugs, you essentially lose your rights to entitlements, housing, assets, education, um, as well as, you know, potentially uh, exposing your children to the broken foster care system. And if you're an immigrant, you risk being deported. So our our the cost to society by imprisoning people far outweighs what we invest in substance use disorder treatment or further upstream interventions like healthy parenting, free higher education and healthcare. Our priorities are really out of whack and the policies uh, around drug use reflect it. So to get very, very specific, a quick example of how crazy this all is. Um, a few years ago, there was a man in Philadelphia who was arrested for having $40 worth of heroin on him. And as part of the asset forfeiture laws, his parents' home was seized because people, uh, the police said that he was selling drugs out of the house. And civil asset for forfeiture is a mechanism where law enforcement agencies can seize and retain property on the suspicion, not the conviction, but the suspicion that the property is connected to a crime. So abolish that particular law. Let's start there. Yeah, I, I would just reinforce um, what was just said with uh, the fact that focusing on um, judicial uh, diversion programs may not be the answer either because, again, once you are caught up, once you have that arrest history um, and you're in front of a judge, it's almost too late in this country because of the way that we are stigmatizing people who are in the criminal justice system and those specifically with addiction in the criminal justice system. So um, the path forward from my perspective is to avoid law enforcement interactions and not have a law enforcement or a judicial system um, response to things that are medical. Um, you know, judges shouldn't be making medical decisions. Uh, some judges actually restrict the use of medications for opioid use disorder, um, even though they do not have a medical license um, and probably shouldn't be making those kinds of decisions. Um, so that's a, an example of, of how um, we may not be, judicial diversion programs may not be the best solution for um, reducing uh, the war, impact of the war on drugs. Excellent, thank you. So, okay. so I, would, yeah, I would take this in a slightly different direction. I think everything that's said has been right. Um, and, you know, the presidency and the moment is, is an opportunity, especially to establish best practices. And those things have huge symbolic value. Um, but there's this line in, in Shakespeare where he says, you know, we sometimes lose the vision of the stars because we stare at the sun. Um, you know, and every star is itself a sun. That is to say, the presidency is actually sometimes just overwhelms our vision. And the president actually has little power over your local law enforcement, right? Your local law enforcement is run by your governor. It's run by your mayor. 
And and while you're absolutely right that the bulk of federal prisoners, or not the bulk, but some huge percentage of federal prisoners are in prison for um, drug crimes, it's also true that the overwhelming percentage of prisoners are in state and local prisons and jails. And so if you if we want to think about how to change things, I would encourage people to get excited about things that aren't always on the front page of the Times. Who's running for your local sheriff? Who's running for your DA? Who's running um, uh, diversion programs? Whether they're working or failing or more restrictive, who's running um, child diversion programs? That is to say, people can't just think now that we voted for a new president, it's over. Voting is the minimum of democracy. Real democracy is being involved in local, local politics. And that's where we can do the most to help people who need the most help. Great. You know, that's an interesting segue. Full disclosure, I'm a pediatrician, so I have to go to kids. And, you know, I think it's interesting that um, all of you did focus on law enforcement, but I think the war on drug, I know that the war on drugs has had pervasive punitive um, impacts in other systems, particularly the child welfare system and the disp disparity among who is tested when they're pregnant, who has their kids taken away when they're pregnant, and how hard it is to get your children back. Um, for reasons that are, in my opinion, similarly not based on science and facts and not and what truthfully happens throughout the country. So just thinking of those other punitive systems, I would say the education system is another space where you have punitive um, responses to drugs, even if someone doesn't end up in the juvenile justice system. Um, but as Monique and others alluded to, lack of access to educational loans, housing, these other impacts. When do you think of that, and I agree that is incredibly local, right? That's how local folks to spend, decide to spend their money on child welfare, how they write the laws, how they um, decide to um, implement them. But thinking of some of these other not criminal justice um, and policing spaces on the war on drugs, do you have ideas for folks who want to work in that space? And those are the things that are not on the front line but have incredible impact on families, incredible impact on family preservation. Um, thoughts in terms of steps for them or thoughts in terms of what Blue Sky would like to see in those areas? And man, especially now, right, with COVID, and, and I just say this because I have kids at home that are homeschooling and you're exhausted and you're working or you're out of work and you're exhausted and you have no childcare. Um, and now the child welfare is saying, well, you can have a video visit or schools saying, well, you didn't do your homework, so I'm gonna check on it. Like all these spaces that, are, that have really been influenced by the war on drugs. Thoughts on what you can say to advocates or parents or adolescents, or where do we start making those changes? So I'll take a first step. I mean, I do think one thing we have to make clear and one way we have to build a coalition is we have to make clear to people that the most important social problems we cannot believe our way out of, right? The criminal justice system will not solve the problem of children having un in unstable homes. It will not solve, look, I mean, this is something we can truly build a consensus in. Whether or not some people are liberal or conservative, we all know the feeling when you see somebody distressed on the street you want to help them. You don't want to call the police to harm them, right? And so to build an intelligent coalition where we say, how can we unbundle this policing so that when we want to help a child who's in distress at school or somebody who's sleeping on my, on my front stoop, that there are real ways I can get help to these people. And that's, again, a way of being locally involved and pushing progress forward. Awesome. I would just add, um, you know, state and local spending on post-secondary education has remained mostly flat for the last 30 years while corrections has increased. I can't get away, I'm sorry, Kima, I can't yep. get away from um, corrections. It's increased by 44%. And there's some experts, I was reading this recently, some experts are saying that a modest 10% increase in high school graduation rates would actually result in a, 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 a similar, about 9% decline in criminal arrests uh, uh, rates. Imagine what a more significant investment could produce, you know. I do think that the scales are tipping in our favor, but if we don't address these kinds of disparities, 
huge swaths of people will continue to be deprived of the means to express, you know, their innovative ideas that have the potential to alter the course that we're on because they don't have access to all of the things that they need. And I'll add to that, that it, it goes back to the social determinants of health um, and thinking about this from an intergenerational perspective, people who are in recovery are potentially re returning from um, prison, they need jobs. They need jobs, um, access to um, training, they need employers who are willing to hire them in recovery sensitive work environments. Um, and so when uh, healthy parents meets healthy kids. And so when you um, address the needs, the employment and housing um, and education uh, needs of parents, you are, in, you are um, addressing downstream consequences for youth. I also think that investing more in education, as, as was already said, is very important because one of the best um, prevention measures for youth um, to develop addiction uh, is to keep kids in school for a longer period of time receiving quality education. Uh, just say no programs don't work, scared straight programs don't work, but if you provide youth with education, um, quality education, then that is likely that is likely to have a big impact on um, uh, problematic drug use later. Great. And unfortunately, now we have to wrap up. Um, I do want to add that I vote for employment. Yes, um, even you know when people are returning, but employment from Git. So you're not again, you're not in the justice system in the first place. But I think that you're absolutely right. That's something especially you have to focus on right now with COVID. And. Um, but I truly want to thank all of you uh, for joining us in this discussion. And now let's hear from the Pennsylvania Secretary of Health, Rachel Levine. Thanks a lot, guys.